American Vampire Volume 8, Dark Moon, written by Scott Snyder, art by Raphael Albuquerque. All right, Volume 8 of American Vampire. This is the final storyline in the second cycle of American Vampire. This series initially came out in 2015, and then after it wrapped, Scott Snyder took about a five-year hiatus on American Vampire. Five years, that's a long time. You would basically assume that the series was dead. But no, in 2020, Scott Snyder came out with American Vampire 1976, which is currently being published, and it's supposedly going to wrap up the story. We'll see, though. So after this video, if you want to jump into that series and read it, you can. When it eventually wraps, I'm going to cover American Vampire 1976 and do a video on that. But for now, this is going to be it for American Vampire. I'm going to be moving on to a new series next week. I'm going to be covering Ed Brubaker's Criminal, one of my favorite series. It's fantastic. I initially wanted to cover this series like five months ago, but I got sidetracked with the other stories I wanted to do. But I'm finally getting to it, so I'm really excited. Be sure to check that out and see if you dig it. But yeah, American Vampire... The end of the second cycle, lots of big stuff goes down in this volume. They go to space. <laughs> um, this volume I felt was very polarizing to me though. This is a series that's supposed to be about vampires and now it's really divulging into this crazy convoluted high concept stuff in this volume. There's going to be a lot of explanation about the Grey Traitor and his history. And when I read the explanation, I was like, what? That is that is out there, man. That is that is some high concept, crazy stuff. I don't know if I really like the explanation. It's 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 a little bit too much, but um, I'm going to explain it to you all and, and we can discuss in the comments how we feel about it. But yeah, some of the stuff in this volume is super crazy and out there and it's a lot of exposition dumping characters just saying like all right well let me explain to you everything and then it's a two or three or four or five minute explanation on on a whole bunch of stuff but um so it's polarizing but it's interesting it's exciting because the stakes are really high so much goes down but um i don't think everyone's gonna exactly love the ending of it but uh Fascinating stuff. Let's dive into it. American Vampire Volume 8, Issue 6, Dark Moon Part 1. The year is 1965. We pick up with Pearl, Skinner, and Calvin in Florida. They arrive at a gate of what appears to be a large mansion. This is apparently the VMS's base in Florida, where they are hoping to learn about the Grey Trader and what they are in for. Skinner doesn't look impressed. He says the mansion looks abandoned. Calvin explains that the government turned on the VMS about 10 years ago, and now the VMS barely has anything left. This place, though, was off the books. It's what they called a black station. Now, while Calvin is talking, Skinner grabs his chest a bit. If you remember from last volume, Skinner somehow got infected by the Grey Trader's minions, and he seems to be struggling to combat this infection and resist it. He fights through the pain, though, for now, and he kicks in the gate doors to this mansion. Pearl, Calvin, and Skinner walk past the gate, where the vampire known as Brun is waiting for them, camouflaging himself to the wall. You might remember Brune from Volume 5, the Lord of Nightmares story arc. His vampire breed is known as a gargoyle, and he is a member of the Firsts. Brune, he attacks Skinner, assuming Skinner to be an enemy. He punches Skinner, and Skinner gets sent flying really high in the air. Calvin and Pearl prepare to fight. Calvin attempts to explain that they are VMS, and they are here to talk about the Grey Trader, and they need help. Brune, he just continues fighting them off, though. He throws Kelvin back. Pearl then punches Brune in his back. Now, there's another vampire there named Joel. He is a mummy vampire. He is constantly transformed and has an appearance similar to a corpse, so he constantly covers himself up. His skin is corrosive in nature, 
and with his touch, he can dissolve organic and inorganic matter. Now Joel, he touches Pearl's shoulder, and it causes her pain, and her skin begins to burn, and she recoils. Skinner, he came back in the fight now. He runs up behind this Joel, and stabs Joel through his chest. Now Pearl, Skinner, and Calvin have managed to both take down Brune and Joel. But there's a third vampire attacker here. His name is Sia, and he is a Gorgon-type vampire. Gorgon, like the Greek mythological monster that can turn people to stone. So this Sia, with his hair, can form a kind of needle with it. And with his needle hair, he can shoot it at his victims. And the hair has a kind of venom in it that would cause petrification of soft tissue in humans to the point of making them appear to have turned to stone. With American vampires, though, this petrification, it just temporarily paralyzes. So Sia, he fires his venom needles from his hair and paralyzes the three of them. After some time passes, Kelvin, Skinner, and Pearl wake up from being paralyzed. They are inside that VMS base here in Florida, with a bright light shining on them. And in to talk with them is the leader of the VMS, Felicia Book. And besides Felicia, we have VMS agent Bixby, whom we've met earlier in Volume 5. Now Felicia, she's talking with Calvin and Pearl, and she is asking them why they brought Skinner Sweet here to their inner sanctum. Felicia and Agent Bixby are still pissed at Skinner Sweet because in Volume 5, which took place in 1954, when Skinner Sweet was an agent of the VMS, he betrayed them and made a deal with Hattie Hargrove and orchestrated an attack on the VMS's base in California, which led to the base being burned down and several agents being killed. Agent Bixby is particularly salty about this, as he was there, and he starts giving Skinner Sweet a piece of his mind. Skinner argues, though, that the VMS put that PRV valve in his chest and ordered him around. Felicia, Agent Bixby, and even Skinner himself are all kind of justified in being angry about this whole situation for various reasons. Pearl, she tries to stop all the arguing though, saying, none of that matters anymore. She tells Felicia about their interaction with the Grey Traitor and how dangerous he is. Felicia is a little shocked that Pearl saw the Grey Traitor in the flesh. Pearl says that the three of them, her, Calvin, and Skinner, are all here to join up. Felicia, thinking about it for a bit, she's gonna allow it. And she welcomes them in to the VMS. The VMS needs more allies, now more than ever. Felicia, she pulls a lever and reveals all their secret VMS stuff all around the room here. We see a bulletin board and circus rings, even an elephant. Felicia explains all about this VMS base here in Florida. It's called the Center Ring. This mansion the VMS is working out of was owned by the Dakota Circus Company and it was ran by a man named Reginald Dakota and it was used as a winter training ground for the Dakota Circus. The Dakotas were paranoid about people seeing their new circus acts, so they built this place beneath their main house for privacy. Reginald was a big believer in the occult and he was a friend to the VMS. And in 1908, before his death, Reginald Dakota donated this mansion to the VMS with two conditions, that his favorite elephant named Maddie be kept alive beyond her normal years with whatever vampirical means that the VMS had. So they made this elephant into a vampire elephant in a way, and it can live on in perpetuity. And number two, was that this place, this mansion, would primarily be used to study the occult. Felicia now goes into an intense explanation about everything they know about the Grey Traitor. And I think it's a wee bit high concept for my liking, but here it is. This is the in-depth explanation of who the Grey Traitor is and what's going on. 
Apparently, 13,000 years ago, before the rise of civilization, something called the beast was let loose upon the earth. The beast is a worm or something. It appears to also go by the name Tiamat, or the mother of beasts, Kerr, the first dragon, or Azag. I don't really know what any of that means, but I guess it means he's some sort of badass evil. It spawned demons across the world, and the skies were clouded with evil, and the oceans roiled with death. But then, a thousand years later, a hero rose named Hurin, and he taught the people to band together and fight the monsters. And he formed an organization called the Brothers of Light, and they were formed to fight the darkness. The Brothers of Light are essentially the vassals of the Morning Star, an early version of it. Huron and the Brothers of Light fought for years against the various monsters of the Beast, until one day Huron made something called the Iskaku, aka the Great Weapon. And with this Iskaku weapon, they were able to destroy the beasts and beat them back, all because of this Huron. Now, at this point in time, we don't know what this Iskaku weapon really is. Now, it turns out, though, that this Grey Traitor was actually this Huron, and his name, the Grey Traitor, is actually a bastardization of his original name, which is the Great Traitor. So, this Huron, this Great Traitor, is actually the Grey Traitor. Huron. He was turned by the beast. So the greatest hero that the VMS or the Brothers of Light ever had, this Huron, he got turned by the beast. Huron, he beat the beast back and then suckled from the beast and then became its great protector, became this gray traitor. Three times in history since that first war 12,000 years ago, the Grey Trader tried to plant the beast into the earth and tried to nurture the beast back to health. He was always beat back though, but the most recent attempt was 700 years ago in Russia in the 1300s. The Grey Trader was nearly successful in reviving this beast, but the VMS used that Iskaku weapon and were able to fight him off. Now, the VMS at this point thought that they defeated the beast for good, as well as the Grey Trader, but they were wrong. In the early 1700s, rumors were that the beast was transported to America, and the Grey Trader was attempting to sink it somewhere in the Nevada desert, where it could nurse the beast back to health. So, the VMS built a secret base in the Nevada desert, all in service of finding the beast's lair there, because they didn't know exactly where it was. Lyndon Hobbs, he even got the Russians to lend the VMS the Iskaku weapon to be housed in this desert base in case the rumors turned out to be true. The VMS and the military, which worked very closely back in those days, performed some underground nuclear detonations throughout the 1950s as a way to try and find the beast's lair. And they were getting close to finding him, but then John F. Kennedy died, and Lyndon Johnson became president. And Johnson, he was not a believer in monsters or the occult, and he was paranoid, so he cut the VMS off. He declared war on them and basically eviscerated them, cut all their funding. But still, this Iskaku weapon, this great weapon, it's still down there in Nevada, beneath that military facility, one of the most heavily guarded in the country. Felicia explains that the Russians know that the beast is here in America too. They know the beast is beneath the ground, getting ready to come out and they know that the Americans are now doing nothing about it. And the Russians are worried about that because they do not want this beast to be reborn again. In fact, Sputnik and the entire Russian satellite program is entirely built to make sure this beast is kept in check 
And if the Russians see any sign of it, any sign of the beast, any sign that the Iskaku weapon is being dismantled, the Russians will launch a full-scale nuclear attack on the US just to kill this beast, just to make sure it is not brought back to life. Calvin yells, but we'd retaliate if they did that. It would be worldwide destruction. And Felicia says that the Russians would take that risk to stop the beast from getting out. Felicia, she welcomes them all to the real Cold War, the real story behind everything. She has a plan, though. She needs a team of six people to pull this off. Three of them will go to the military base in Nevada, and the other three of them are going to have to go up into space. Pearl asks, you need a team of six, but there are nine of us here. Felicia explains, though, that she has it on good authority that the VMS has been compromised by minions of the Grey Trader who are everywhere, members of the Tongue. Felicia says that when humans or whomever drink at the beast's teat and ingest his pathogens or milk, they develop abilities. They're stronger and whatnot, but they also have weaknesses. They have no sodium tolerance in their blood and are thereby weak to salt. Felicia, she calls for Maddie the elephant to act. Maddie sucks up some salt water and sprays three members of Felicia's group that have been compromised by the Grey Trader. When the salt water hits them, they begin melting and Agent Bixby finishes them off by shooting them. And this thus ends Felicia's convoluted long exposition dumping. And she says, we're hiring, what do you say? And of course, Calvin, Skinner, and Pearl are in. Issue 7, Dark Moon Part 2. In Florida, we see some sort of party going on by a pool. People are swimming and doing the limbo, but then some ugly-ass worm monsters pop out of a crack in the ground and begin attacking and killing everyone there. These worm-like creatures are called the Sixth Breed. They are the beasts, parasites, humans that have been transformed by the beast. We jump over to Pearl and Felicia. They're driving a truck with Brune in the back. They are headed to Nevada. Their mission is going to be to break into Area 51, which is the military facility that is holding this Iskaku weapon. They're going to try and go there and retrieve it. Pearl and Felicia talk along the way. They are getting acquainted with one another, sharing some of their history. Then the conversation turns to discussing the actual plan. Felicia explains that Brune, he's what they call a tunneler, and he's going to dig them into this military base. He's going to dig them down sideways and then up right inside the base. And then when they go topside in Area 51, they'll use that venom from the stalks from that Agent Sia's skull, that Gorgon type vampire, and they will use it to temporarily incapacitate any humans because they have weaponized his venom into something called Gorgon Gas. And then when they incapacitate all the soldiers there, they will walk out of that base with the Iskaku weapon. Pearl, she thinks it's a crazy plan and will never work, but it's all they got. We jump over to Skinner Sweet, Kelvin Poole, Agent Bixby, and Joel the Mummy. They are looking at a NASA rocket launch complex there in Florida. Because for their part of the mission, they're going to have to go to space. Agent Bixby shares some sort of secret history of NASA. That five years earlier in 1960, Joel the Mummy here was actually secretly the first man in space. NASA was worried about the stresses of space on the human body. So they sent this Joel instead, and it was a success. Joel successfully went to space and came back. And because of this assistance, when the government turned their back on the VMS, 
NASA was the one agency that kept the VMS in their good graces. But the VMS is pretty much on the outs with every other government agency. Anyway, Agent Bixby explains their convoluted problem. Right now, the Russians have a satellite in space called the Okhrana. And this Okhrana satellite, it takes pictures every few hours of Earth and then eventually ejects its film at the end of the month and that film comes back down to Earth in Russia for the Russians to look at. And I guess this satellite, this Okhrana, is monitoring the Americans. And if that tape that's been taking pictures in the, the Nevada desert makes its way to Russia and shows that the Americans are not keeping this beast in check and that this Iskaku weapon is being threatened and might get destroyed or whatnot, if the Russians see any sign of this trouble, then the Russians will surely launch a nuclear strike in order to kill this beast, starting nuclear war. So, the convoluted plan is that the VMS here, working with NASA, will go into space. Two NASA astronauts, friends of the VMS, will pilot the rocket ship. And then, two of them, in this case it's going to be Joel the Mummy and Calvin, will go up in the rocket as well in a different compartment. The spaceship will pilot up to the Russian satellite, and then Calvin and Joel will go out into space and retrieve whatever film needs to be retrieved from this satellite, so that the Russians will be none the wiser of some of the problems going on in the United States. Bixby says that the launch of the rocket ship will be two days from now, so they have two days to get ready. Later on, back in his hotel room, Skinner Sweet is getting more sick. The Grey Trader's infection in his body is growing and getting worse. We see Skinner's veins are getting all black and Skinner is sweating. Eventually, Calvin, Bixby, and Joel confront Skinner about it, pointing a gun at him. They know that Skinner is infected and they say it's too risky to leave him alive. What if he turns into this crazy monster? Skinner argues he can fight the infection, but Agent Bixby explains that no one has ever successfully fought it. Skinner, he's just not gonna lie down and let them kill him, he's gonna fight back. And as he prepares to fight his allies, all of a sudden, those sixth breed worm monsters from the beginning of this issue bust in through the hotel room door and they say, can we play? and they start attacking. Bixby and Calvin turn their guns toward these giant worm monsters and fire upon them. Bixby tells Skinner in desperation to prove himself right now, help them, and he'll let the infection thing go. He'll let Skinner live. Skinner doesn't reply though, and Bixby calls out to Skinner once again, but we see Skinner Sweet has transformed into that big red monster the same thing we saw May transform into after she got infected last volume. Issue 8, Dark Moon Part 3 Calvin, Joel, and Agent Bixby are fighting off the sixth breed. Skinner Sweet has transformed into this big red monster because of his infection from the Beast and the Grey Traitor. Skinner's mind is no longer his own, and he is forced to join forces with the Sixth Breed, and he starts attacking Bixby. Calvin is trying to talk Skinner Sweet down, and tells Skinner to fight it, fight the control that this infection is having over him. Joel, he gets sliced up by this Sixth Breed, his hands get chopped off, and he is severely injured. Skinner, he is choking Agent Bixby, and Bixby is trying to talk to Skinner and get through to him. He asks him, is this how you want it to end for you, sweet? Turned into a slave? He then spits in Skinner's face. The sixth breed begin urging Skinner onward, and they tell him, go on, cowboy, kill him. What are you waiting for? Skinner, something snaps him out of it. We're just a bit there. He drops Agent Bixby, and then he lunges at those sixth breed worm monsters. He tackles them right through the motel room wall. Skinner is 
throwing the sixth breed around, smashing them into cars, decapitating them, crushing them, etc. He eventually seems to finish all of them off. We jump over to Pearl, Felicia, and Brune. Brune is now digging a nice big tunnel for them, and they are right under Area 51's military base. Brune now has to dig up. Felicia explains the plan before they go, though. She says that once they reach the surface of Area 51, there is a man there named General Dizzy Rosicki, and the VMS have worked with this General Dizzy before for nearly a decade. He is an ally of the VMS. So once they reach the surface, this General Dizzy will meet them, and Pearl and Felicia's cover story will be that they are flight instructors and they are going to get a tour of the airstrip there, and then he will sneak them down below to the bunker where this Iskaku weapon is being kept. Pearl finally asks Felicia, what is this Iskaku weapon exactly? And Felicia admits she doesn't even really know. It was kept secret from her. She heard Hobbes use the phrase blood of light once in reference to it, but she's not entirely sure what it is. Back over to Skinner, Calvin, Bixby, and Joel. Skinner, he is recuperating. He is in his normal human form once again. And Joel the mummy is in worse shape and he is healing. Joel the mummy actually needs to be licked back together by dung beetles in order to repair his necrotic tissue. Bixby explains that Skinner has been given an expensive gold IV drip. The virus in his veins that was turning Skinner into this monster, well, it feeds on health, on healthy cells. And the gold IV drip will keep Skinner's body weaker, so Skinner's body will be less inclined to transform again, for now at least. The bad news is, though, that they will have to keep upping the dosage of the gold IV drip, and it will eventually kill Skinner's sweet. So Skinner Sweet is kind of dead no matter what. He either keeps getting the Gold IV drip and he doesn't transform into the monster, but the Gold IV will eventually kill him, or he turns into the mindless monster and is basically gone then as well. Agent Bixby wants Skinner Sweet to join the mission to space with Calvin. Initially, Joel was going to go, but Joel's in bad shape now. His body is healing and reforming from these dung beetles. He's in no shape to go up there. Skinner, he doesn't want to join the mission to space. He's going to die anyway. He'd rather die on Earth. But Bixby promises a possible cure for Skinner. There's a group called the Council of the Firsts. They might be able to help Skinner. If Skinner pulls off this space mission, Bixby promises that he'll help Skinner find them and see if there is a cure. Kelvin reiterates that Agent Bixby is telling the truth. Skinner, sweet, not having much of a choice, not wanting to die to this virus again, agrees to go on the mission to space. Back over to Pearl and Felicia. They meet this General Dizzy Rosicki, and he informs them that he suspects some members of the Tongue may have infiltrated the military base, so he warns them to stay on high alert. Now he tries to pass Pearl and Felicia off as these flight instructors to some of the other military officers there. But these military officers, they are very skeptical and are not buying the story. They are suspicious, and they are not going to allow Pearl and Felicia to go anywhere. Pearl and Felicia are forced to break their cover story they had for all of five minutes. They spray the soldiers with some of that Gorgon gas, and it will temporarily turn these soldiers into stone. They then head with this General Dizzy down to the lower levels of the base to try and find this Iskaku weapon. They enter a vault, and they see a pile of dead bodies, and Dizzy realizes they are too late. Some soldiers pile into the room to stop them from infiltrating the lower levels. Pearl and Felicia, they put on some gas masks and throw some more of that Gorgon gas around and it freezes some of the soldiers there. 
Pearl, Felicia, and General Dizzy round another corner, heading to an elevator, but they are confronted by many more infected tongue soldiers that have been turned into beastly monsters. And it is revealed now that General Dizzy himself even is secretly a member of the tongue and has been turned as well. He removes his gas mask and gloats, sorry ladies, but this is where the mission ends for all of you. We jump over to Calvin and Skinner. They are in the rocket, preparing to go to space. Bixby on Earth is talking to them through a communication device. He wishes them luck. Bixby then signs off. But then he secretly talks through the communication device to Calvin by himself, without Skinner being able to hear. Agent Bixby tells Calvin that once they're in space and they switch out the film canister on the space satellite and the mission is looking like it's going to be successful, Calvin is to follow the plan of blowing Skinner Suite to hell. So, they are planning on betraying the Skinner Suite and leaving him up there in space to die. And with that, the rocket ship blasts off into space. Issue 9, Dark Moon Part 4 I am not too sure what to make of this part of the story. The timeline states that this is taking place in Las Vegas, now and forever. So what year is that? I don't know. Up to interpretation what that means. Las Vegas appears to be some sort of post-apocalyptic wasteland. Gus McCougan, son of Cash McCougan, adopted son of Felicia Book, is leading a vampire named Juliet and a girl named Evie. They mentioned a breed of vampire called the Forths, which they have to avoid. They eventually get attacked and get sucked into the ground, and Gus screams, Fight them off! Come on, it can't end like this! The Chosen One is... And then he gets killed by Skinner Sweet, and Skinner says, Sorry kid, it ended a long time ago. And then the Grey Traders talking to Skinner says, We're waiting for you, Skinner. And in the Grey Traders' mouth we hear Jim Book, and Jim Book says, It's me, Jim Book! I'm in here with Jeeks and Ronnie, and it's a whole new world. Come on in and play. So perhaps it was just a bad dream, because Skinner in the rocket, he appears to be maybe hallucinating or his mind is wandering. Then he snaps out of it. We see the spaceship has exited Earth's atmosphere and is now into the deeper reaches of space. We jump over to Pearl and Felicia in Area 51. They are trapped in some sort of glass-looking chamber. General Dizzy, who is now on the side of the tongue, he is questioning Pearl and Felicia. He also reveals that they have captured Brune and have strapped him down and are going to cut into him. Dizzy asks them all any info they have on their allies, the Firsts, or the Ancient Vampires, or what about Gus McCougan? Everyone refuses to talk. So eventually, Brune, his hard body is cut into, and his body explodes apart, with pieces of him flying everywhere. Well, Dizzy, he is done with Pearl and Felicia, recognizing that they are not gonna speak. Dizzy begins having this acid fed into the chamber, which will eventually eat away and kill Felicia and Pearl. General Dizzy, he leaves. And Felicia and Pearl, well, the two of them are cowering on top of a table, trying not to touch the acid. The table starts melting, and Pearl and Felicia will soon be engulfed in that acid. Outside of the chamber, two members of the Tongue, infected guards there, they are messing around and throwing Brune's decapitated head back and forth. They assumed that Brune was dead, but... Brune was not. Brune, even though he's decapitated, apparently is still conscious and he spits corrosive acid himself. He spits that acid and it lands on the outside of that chamber wall that Pearl and Felicia are in. That acid from Brune is enough to destabilize the chamber wall. 
and create a small weakness and crack in the wall and give Pearl and Felicia the opening they need to bust it open and get out of there. Pearl and Felicia, they do so. They manage to break out of that chamber. They start fighting with the tongue soldiers in the room and then they begin running. Pearl says that they need to get to this Iskaku weapon. Felicia says it's too late for that. General Dizzy would have already taken off with the weapon. So they need to move to plan B now. There are three nuclear weapons beneath them. They need to use them to end the world and destroy the beast. Well, while all that was going on with them, let's see what's going on in space. Skinner Sweet and Calvin are up there. The rocket has left Earth's atmosphere and they are approaching the Okrana satellite. Calvin and Skinner, they have a heart-to-heart -heart talk right now while they're waiting for the spaceship to get where it needs to get. Calvin, he talks about his brother Del Poole. Del was apparently taking part in the civil rights movement down there on Earth. He was just a small cog in the wheel of the overall bigger protests going on. And while he was doing that sit-in, a man split his head open. And his brother Del is now in a hospital room where he'll die one day and no one will remember him. Calvin wonders, what is it all really for? What's the point of it all? Is Earth really worth saving? He's trying to see things with the optimism that his brother Dale had though, and he's trying to do the right thing and try to save the Earth, even though there's some bad people on it. And Calvin tells Skinner, so just do me a favor, sweet. Up here alone, together, help me try, alright? They are approaching the satellite, Calvin and Skinner. They depart from their spacecraft and they begin to head over to the Russian satellite. And when they open the Russian satellite's hatch door, though, inside are Russian Carpathian astronauts that have been turned into vampires. Issue 10, Dark Moon Part 5 Calvin and Skinner in space are fighting the Russian Carpathian vampires. Calvin theorizes that the Russians put them up here to protect the satellite. Apparently, these Carpathians are third tier, so they are stronger and more infectious than regular Carpathian vampires. Skinner's spacesuit gets stabbed with a knife, and this really pisses Skinner off, so he slashes and decapitates one of the Russian astronaut vampires. And one of the other Russian astronaut vampires starts heading for the film in the satellite. Calvin yells for Skinner to stop him. Skinner notices that when he got stabbed earlier through his spacesuit, it severed the gold IV drip that was helping him stop from turning. So he potentially might turn soon. Skinner, he freezes a little bit on this realization. Calvin, he's forced to pursue that Russian astronaut making his way to the film himself. The Russian presses a button ejecting the film from the satellite. Calvin catches up to that Russian astronaut and smashes his head in. The film starts floating into space. It would eventually fall down to Earth if they did nothing. Calvin yells for Skinner to try and grab that film before it's too late. Skinner is trying to resist the Grey Trader's influence on his mind. Skinner, he tells Calvin he's on it. Skinner jumps off and tries to grab that tape, and he manages to do it, but he jumped too far and too fast, and he severed the line that was anchoring him to their spaceship. So now Skinner, he's just floating around in space. Skinner, he tries to use some of the gas in his pack to propel himself back to their ship, but he's out of gas there. Kelvin, he decides to risk his life and he severs his own line and floats out into space and manages to get in close enough to Skinner and grab him before they were both floating away too far. Calvin then uses the gas in his pack and tries to shoot themselves back over to their spaceship. By some miracle, they make it, and both Calvin and Skinner manage to climb back into their rocket ship safely. Skinner wonders why Calvin 
risked his life to save him. Especially with his gold IV line severed, he could turn any minute into this monster. Calvin says that he's dumb, what can he say? The two of them are back in their rocket ship now and they're getting ready to come back home to Earth. They got what they needed. Let's jump over to Pearl and Felicia. They are fighting through various soldiers down there in Area 51. Pearl is trying to talk some sense into Felicia and talk her out of using the nuclear weapons. Felicia. She shoots Pearl and she tells Pearl that this was always the backup plan. It's what has to be done. Right now, General Dizzy and the Tongue have stolen the Iskaku weapon and are bringing it to that sinkhole wherever the beast is and they are bringing our only effective weapon right to the Grey Trader and the beast itself. If we fire our nuclear bomb and the Russians attack us, we might still be able to kill the beast. People will live through it, maybe not here in this country but in other places around the world. So Felicia, she's willing to make the hard choice of sacrificing millions of lives so long as the beast will die and she will thereby be saving the greater world. Pearl argues though that the cost is too great. Millions will die and she equates that to them just giving up. Pearl says it's not hopeless. That's just what the Grey Trader wants us to think because that's what the assholes of the world always want us to think. That there's no point in fighting. But Pearl tells Felicia that they need to have hope. They need to have optimism. Her motivational speech seems to have worked. They are going to try and retrieve that Iskaku weapon from this General Dizzy. They steal one of the military helicopters there at Area 51 and in the sky they start pursuing a truck convoy led by this General Dizzy that is transporting the Iskaku weapon to the Beast and the Grey Trader. So they're flying above this military convoy. Pearl, she jumps out of the helicopter and lands on the truck that is transporting this weapon. Pearl, she manages to open the driver's side door, throw the driver out of that truck, and she is now driving the truck herself with the weapon in it. It actually looks like they might pull this off. However, not everything is as it seems. We jump back over to Agent Bixby. He is talking through the radio communication device over there at NASA to Calvin Poole and Skinner Sweet. He's talking on a private line to them though. Calvin and Skinner tell Agent Bixby that they are ready to come home. Agent Bixby though, he tells them that the controls on their spaceship capsule have gone out and both of their NASA pilots are dead. Apparently they were poisoned before takeoff and the poison has now kicked in. And that someone that poisoned them was him. So Agent Bixby is a traitor. He is working for the tongue. The rest of NASA don't know anything and they are still working hard to save Calvin and Skinner, but not Agent Bixby. Agent Bixby knows that Calvin and Skinner have no chance of survival. He thanks them though for covering up the tongue's tracks with the Russians he tells them that they will die now together. So Agent Bixby was using them to steal that film in the Russian satellite because if they did not do that, the Russians would know something was up and they would start nuclear war on the United States and kill them all, but now their tracks are covered. All that's left for Bixby to do now is go celebrate with his people over the bodies of Felicia and Pearl out there in the desert. Agent Bixby admits though that Pearl and Felicia are more resilient than he suspected. They are still alive and they actually have the Iskaku weapon in their possession. But what Felicia and Pearl don't know is that they are actually headed right into a trap. They think they have the upper hand but really they are heading right where Agent Bixby wants them to go. Issue 11 Dark Moon Part 6. This is the final issue in the second cycle of American Vampire. Pearl is driving the truck with the Iskaku weapon now. The army convoy is pursuing them. 
They drive beside Pearl, but she just manages to smash them off the road. We see Felicia. She is flying that helicopter. She spots the gray traitor, though, out in the distance. And Felicia, she's angry, determined, pissed off. She is now hovering the helicopter in front of this gray traitor. The gray traitor then starts talking. The gray traitor is speaking in Gus's voice, the voice of Felicia's adopted son. And he says, Mom? Mom? Is that you? He found me, Mom. He found me and Travis in our hiding spot. And now we're in here. Felicia cries. But she says, Stop it! You're not real! And as she hesitated here for a moment, the other Grey Trainer minions with their military gear managed to shoot the helicopter down that Felicia was flying. And the helicopter crashes down to the earth. Pearl, driving that truck, sees Felicia's copter get shot out of the sky and she screams, Felicia, no! Pearl, she is wondering what she is going to do. General Dizzy and the military convoy are still following her. She decides to turn off the main road and begins driving out into the desert. Pearl, she's trying to get somewhere before they catch up to her. She has this plan though and she says to herself, just a little farther now, come on. Dizzy and his men confirm that the truck Pearl is driving with the Iskaku weapon is reinforced, and if they fire on it, the Iskaku will not be endangered. Upon that news, General Dizzy orders that they fire the rocket launchers on Pearl's truck. So they do so. A rocket launcher hits the back of the truck Pearl is driving, and the truck crashes and turns on its side, sliding to a stop. Now before we see the fate of Pearl, Let's jump over to Skinner and Calvin in space. They are still talking to Agent Bixby over the radio. Bixby, rather than leave Calvin and Skinner to die, he decides to do that James Bond villain thing where he goes over the entire convoluted evil plan in excruciating detail. So we are going to get ourselves some heavy exposition dumping. Agent Bixby explains that the bite on Skinner Sweet will soon turn him, and he will turn into that monster, and he will tear Calvin apart. There is nothing they can do. Their pilots are now dead, they were poisoned, and the fuel line to the thrusters of their spacecraft have been cut. It was set to dissolve from a carefully diluted swipe of Agent Joel's skin cells. So it would hold long enough to get them up there in space, but then it would dissolve and it would leave them stranded up there. Bixby then goes on to explain all about the Beast, and the plans for the Beast, and how Skinner Sweet was actually going to tie into those plans. So apparently this Beast, it gestates down in the ground until it's grown the army it needs. It grows its army by infecting older species of the Homo Abominus line to make its warriors. Apparently for the last 700 years there have been six main bloodlines of vampires. But then, with Skinner Sweet, there are now seven lines. Once this beast creates its armies, it needs to find a host. And that host will become pregnant with the beast itself. And he or she must be one of the newest vampire bloodlines. The most evolved bloodlines. So the tongue, they went after the first of this seventh bloodline a long time ago. It was a woman, a female vampire named Mimite. You all remember Mimite, right? The Native American vampire we saw briefly in Volume 4 in the Beast in the Cave story arc? Well, at that point in time, Mimite was the most evolved vampire, so they chose her. They were going to impregnate her with the Beast. But then... Skinner Sweet came along and he kind of ruined everything because he was an even more advanced, newer breed of vampire. He was the newest breed and the beast always needs the best. He needs the newest model. He's not going to be impregnated in the iPhone 11 and Mimite when the iPhone 12 just came out in Skinner Sweet. So Skinner Sweet was marked with the bite, marked to become the host for this beast. They were going to impregnate Skinner Sweet with the Beast. That was the plan. Then Skinner would eventually become the Beast itself. Skinner would have became king of this new world. It's why that sixth breed, K-1, 
came to collect Skinner a few issues ago. They were coming to get him once he turned so they could impregnate him. <laughs> it could have all been his if only he, Agent Bixby, hadn't taken it away from Skinner. Bixby suspects that the Grey Trader and his minions may be a little bit upset with him for ruining their plans of impregnating Skinner Sweet, as he has now basically just left Skinner Sweet to his death in space. But Bixby figures it's not a big deal. They're still Pearl Jones, they can impregnate her. Bixby, he then gloats some more and says his goodbyes to Skinner and Calvin. Calvin and Skinner think it's over. They're gonna die out here. But Skinner decides to try and do something. He opens the spacecraft door. He climbs around and he finds the fuel line that had been cut that dissolved away in the acid and melted and now it's broken apart. And it's not going to hold. But Skinner says that if he stays out here and holds it together himself, there is a chance that Kelvin can make it back to Earth. Kelvin tells Skinner that he'll die out there, he'll burn up out here. Skinner says that he's taken one last ride whether Kelvin likes it or not. Skinner, he starts holding the fuel line together himself manually. NASA, down there on Earth, now have a connection to the rocket ship because the fuel line is feeding the systems once again and the power has been restored. NASA decides that they're going to try and fire the rockets remotely and get that spaceship the push it needs to come back home down to Earth. The rockets on the spaceship fire. The spaceship starts moving, it's coming back down. They have to brace for re-entry getting back into Earth's atmosphere. Kelvin is inside the spaceship. He assumes that they're not gonna make it. The spaceship manages to crash back down to Earth. All right, let's jump back over to Pearl and see what happens with her. They shot the truck that she was driving down and it has crashed. Pearl, she eventually managed to climb out of the truck wreckage. General Dizzy and the rest of the members of the Tongue are there with him, and they are going to confront Pearl. General Dizzy thinks that this is the end of the road for Pearl, but Pearl's plan has come to fruition now, though. She has some sort of hose from that truck. I think it's a gas hose. She informs Dizzy to look where they are. There's tons of salt around here. They're right on top of a dried lake. This area is full of them, and she knows that the members of the Tongue are weak to salt. She starts spraying the hose as hard as she can, shooting the ground around them, and by doing so, she manages to spray General Dizzy and the rest of the members of the Tongue here with enough salt to kill them all. Pearl, she now appears to be safe. No other members of the Tongue are around for now. She walks back over to that truck, she is finally going to see what is inside, what this Iskaku weapon actually is. She opens the truck and it's revealed to be a gigantic alien looking head? Felicia, who apparently did not die in that helicopter crash, has managed to stumble her way over here to Pearl and she sees that gigantic head as well. And Pearl asks, is this thing from outer space? Felicia says that uh, it's of Earth, not from space. Felicia explains that she didn't think the stories were real, that this must be the last one, or part of him at least, his head. The Iskaku is apparently the opposite of Huron's army, the opposite of the tongue or what the beast is. People thought that this Iskaku group of people were angels, a being made from the blood of light. While well, Pearl, she comments that they need to get this head thing out of here. Back over to Calvin. His rocket ship has crashed back down to Earth and he is still alive. Calvin, he walks over to see Skinner's body down there in the desert and he assumes that Skinner Sweet is dead. As Calvin begins walking away though, Skinner coughs. He is alive. Skinner, naked, crawls out of the crater in the ground, and Kelvin is happy, but then concerned. 
Calvin tells Skinner, you're alive. And Skinner coughs and says, you thought a little sunburn would take me out? And Calvin continues, no, Skinner, I mean, you're not undead anymore. I can hear your pulse. You're alive. And Skinner, he says, what the F? He feels for his pulse on his neck and he realizes that Calvin is right. Calvin theorizes that it must have been the sun, unadulterated by the atmosphere. It burned away your bite, but it also somehow cured you. But that doesn't make any sense. I, I don't understand. Skinner, not liking to hear this news, tells Calvin, cut your wrist. And Calvin, he's refusing, but Skinner insists, I saved your goddamn life. Open your goddamn wrist. Calvin, he slits his wrist and lets some blood pour out and he pours it into Skinner's eye. The blood is in Skinner's eye and Skinner says it, it's not working. Nothing's freaking happening. So Skinner Sweet appears to now be human again? Pearl and Felicia have managed to get that Iskaku in another truck and get it moving again. They are trying to figure out where they should go now. They decide to bring the truck to a guy Felicia knows, a Gaelic Prime vampire, and they'll figure things out from there. We jump back over to the Dakota Circus, the center ring, the VMS base there in Florida we were at earlier. Agent Bixby is burning everything to the ground. He's trying to destroy the last of the VMS's records. But while he is there burning everything, he is visited by the Sixth Breed, one of the beast's minions. They are there to kill him for messing up their plans for impregnating Skinner Sweet. And Bixby begs, please, please, remember, all the things coming. The plan is almost complete. The vessel in the Valley of the Kings? The White House? Remember how I've helped? Remember everything I've done? And the Sixth Breed reply, oh, don't worry. We remember all of it. Bixby then screams. As we assume the Sixth Breed kill him as Maddie the Vampire Elephant watches onward. And that is the end of Volume 8. Alright, that was Volume 8. And I have some major thoughts on this volume. Uh, I don't know if uh, my opinion is going to be controversial or a lot of you will agree with me. But I'm very curious to, to hear what all of you thought of this volume. Um, but first, let me say what I did enjoy. You know, I think Vampires Going to Space was exciting. That was really fun seeing Skinner and Calvin team up and having to do various things up there and go to that Russian satellite and the Russians are in there, but they're astronaut vampires. That was fun. I liked Pearl and Felicia having to hook up and do their own little mission at Area 51. So that was fun. And it was a very exciting volume. Lots goes down. World ending stakes. That was all very cool. Now, where I'm a little less into this volume is that it was a little bit too high concept for me. I didn't love the direction the story was going. I liked the book when it was about vampires. And now it's about something else. It's not about vampires anymore. It's about whatever this gray traitor concept is in the beast. Okay. This whole concept of the beast and how 12,000 years ago, he spawned demons across the world and the skies were clouded with evil and the oceans roiled with death. And then this Huron created the Brothers of Light and created this Iskaku weapon and fought the beast back. And now he got turned and now he's trying to uh, create the beast once again in the world and grow him and impregnate him into these other beasts. And it's like, whoa. Whoa, over my head, that's, what? What's going on here? I don't know, I just, I'm not into that, that concept. I liked vampires, you know, I liked Dracula, and I liked stuff building off of that. Now we're going into this whole other deal, and um, I don't know, I don't know if I dig it. And um, it was kind of messy and convoluted too, like, this whole Agent Bixby's plan, and how... They're going to impregnate Skinner, and I don't know, I guess it made sense, but it was all a little bit too much for me. So, uh, yeah, I, I didn't dig it. I find that Scott Snyder, he writes this high-concept, convoluted stuff a lot more now. When I started reading Scott Snyder in the early 2010s in his 
Batman run. I thought it was so good. But when I read Scott Snyder now and his other work, it's all very high concept now. If you've read his Justice League run, there's all these like gods and this perpetual woman and this source wall in the DC universe. And it's like crazy concepts. And then he wrote this whole Dark Knight's death metal storyline. And there's all sorts of crazy concepts there. And the the Batman who laughs, that's like an evil infected Joker version of Batman. It's all sorts of just bonkers stuff. And now I'm seeing that in American Vampire now with some of this kind of a bonkers stuff. It's, it's, it's out there. It's out there. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't love it that much. So uh, I'm going to give this volume a uh, 7 out of 10. Uh, there's lots of aspects I liked. I liked some of the twists in the story. And um, I'm really excited to see where it's going to go, though. I want to see how this wraps. But, um, you know, I'm losing the thread a little bit. I'm not loving some of the directions we went to, but that's just my personal opinion. I know some of you out there probably love this and love this whole sort of backstory of the gray trader and what was going on. So I'm very curious to hear what some of uh, your thoughts are. So let me know in the comments, but uh, thank you all for watching. And I will be back next week with the fantastic criminal series. If you want to see some criminals pulling off heists and whatnot, Tune in for that.